Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. I hope this podcast and my blog and books have been helpful resources for you and will continue to be. But if you've been struggling with a chronic health problem and are feeling stuck, consider coming to work with my team and me at the California Center for Functional Medicine. We work with patients all over the U.S. and have experience treating a wide range of conditions, including GI problems, autoimmunity, hypothyroidism, cognitive mood and behavioral issues, weight gain and metabolic dysfunction, and more. Our unique model teams, clinicians with nurse practitioners and health coaches, all of whom are trained in my ADAPT framework approach to provide a high level of care to our patients. This means more support between appointments, personalized guidance on diet, lifestyle, and behavior change, a cutting edge patient portal with 24 seven access to your labs and records, handouts and resources to guide your protocols, and a team of practitioners working together on your case. We're currently accepting new patients, so if you'd like to learn more, visit chriscresser.com slash become a patient. Hey everybody, it's Chris Cresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Mark Pimentel back on the show as my guest. Dr. Pimentel is currently the head of the Pimentel Laboratory and Executive Director of the Medically Associated Science and Technology, or MAST, program at Cedar sinai This program focuses on the development of drugs, diagnostic tests, and devices related to conditions of the microbiome. Dr. Pimentel has been very active in research and served as a principal investigator or co-investigator for numerous basic sciences, translational and clinical studies in areas like IBS and the relationship between gut flora composition and human disease. He's widely known and sought out for major scientific developments that he's pioneered, including the discovery that IBS is a condition of altered intestinal microbial activity. I've had Dr. Pimentel on the show before to talk about SIBO and the many outstanding questions and things that we're still exploring about that mysterious condition. And I wanted to have him back on to discuss that same topic because there have been some new developments in the field and some uh, exciting new announcements that Dr. Pimentel recently made at a conference Uh, as well as some other papers published by different researchers that I wanted to get Dr. Pimentel's opinion about. So this one might get pretty technical, but I I know that many of you are following this topic closely, and I hope you find this to be valuable. Okay, let's dive in. Dr. Pimentel, thanks so much for coming back on the show. I've been really looking forward to this. Chris, it's great to talk to you again. So let's let's start uh, with kind of a 30,000-foot view how has your understanding of SIBO shifted, if it has, over the past few years? Well, it's a very broad question, but I think uh, my understanding of SIBO has shifted quite substantially for in, another, in a number of areas. First of all, we now better understand why SIBO is occurring. Um, for example, you know, we're measuring new antibodies that are derived from food poisoning that can actually be the cause of SIBO. So these are the anti-CDTB and anti vinculin antibodies. And that can now tell patients, you know, what was the mechanism? What started the whole thing? And in, in, in some cases, or in a lot of cases, it's food poisoning. Of mm-hmm. course, there are other causes of SIBO. Another touch point that's relatively new, literally just this week, we presented the first deep sequencing of the small bowel at the at DDW course, which is our GI national meeting. And we were able to show for the first time exactly who were the culprits, particularly in SIBO of, uh, of the hydrogen type. Uh, the evolution of methane as a component of constipation and the organisms and bugs that are involved there, plus treatments around that ha- are co- completely changing. So I could go on and on, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a good starting base. Early yeah. points there. Let's dive into the, to each of those a little bit more, because um, I know we, we had talked on the last show about the antibody testing. Uh, and at that time, it wasn't yet available, and it is now. I think it's called the IBS SMART blood that's test. Right. Is yes. that correct? That's so yeah, right. tell us a little bit more about that particular line of, of research where you discovered that after a bout of food poisoning, the body produces antibodies to these proteins, vinculin and uh, CDTB, and then that has an impact on the motility of the small intestine that can lead to the development of SIBO. That's my understanding. Is that correct? 
That's right. So basically, you get a case of food poisoning. Usually, it's bacterial, like Campylobacter, Salmonella, mm -hmm. E. coli, Shigella, those types of things that can happen at restaurants or eating tainted food. And and then after that, that diarrhea episode that you get, the diarrhea kind of settles. But there's a particular toxin that we did discovered uh, that is important for you to go from just having that old, old food poisoning to now developing a motility disorder of the gut. And, you know, while it's, it's on, it's, you know, been relaunched as IBS smart because this is a new generation test, much more specific. In mm. fact, let me just dive into the specificity. Sure. Both markers, the anti CDTB and the anti vinculin are over 90% predictive of irritable bowel syndrome uh, with diarrhea. But if both markers are positive, you have a 98% certainty. And wow. you know, there's a lot of, I know we talked about it before, but there's, there's a lot that this helps patients with because, you know, you go to your doctor, your doctor says you have IBS. They don't know why you got IBS. This mm -hmm. will tell you why. Mm -hmm. The doctor says you have IBS, but that's based on experience, not on any kind of biological marker. This is really a biological marker. And we think these markers are the cause of IBS, particularly the anti vinculin that antibody that goes against yourself, which makes the gut slow down, which makes right. the bacteria build up. So, uh, you know, you're going to go to your doctor and you're going to talk to them about the test and they're not going to know about it because it's so new. It doesn't mean you can't get it. You just have to, you know, tell your doctor you want it. And But I've been using it in practice now for six months and it's helped me immensely to establish that diagnosis and confirm it. And, and, and having an organic biomarker means you have a real disease. It's not right. in your head. And I think that's even the most uh, compelling reason. Validating for patients. You could, I, I mean, this is taking IBS out of the realm of being a diagnosis of exclusion, where you just exclude other structural conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or diverticulitis or something like that. And then you meet certain criteria and then you're just labeled with IBS. And now it sounds like this is not only a a now a specific diagnosis, I mean, are, would you go as far as to call it an autoimmune condition? That's a great question, Chris, because they, the reality is maybe in a couple of years, we'll rename the condition because it, it could be an autoimmune disease, uh, IBS. So that's what we're thinking, at least right. in the subset that are positive. But, but, you know, another way to look at this is if you, if you end up in a gastroenterologist's office with IBS or with diarrhea of unexplained etiology or understanding, your doctor's going to want to do a colonoscopy. You have a copay of $500 plus on that. They're going to want to do an ultrasound. You're going to have a copay on that. They're going to want to do stool tests and blood tests. And by the time you ratchet up all those costs, you're out a couple thousand dollars. Why? Why? If you're 25 years old, why waste all that? effort, you're going to be, have to take time off work to do the colonoscopy. If the blood test is positive on both markers, you're more than 98% certain you have the condition. Right. So it's going to save money in the healthcare system, but also the hassle for patients. So lots going on there. Yeah. And I've got more questions. So anecdotally, I, I don't know if you did any research on this. I mean, it's hard because people's memories are not reliable, but anecdotally, just from your own work, have, do you find that this is even more likely in people who recall becoming ill after food poisoning, like that where their symptoms started after an episode of food poisoning, or is it, is it, because I know in some cases that some, some of these pathogens, we can actually even have them and not have a serious episode of, of diarrhea and be almost uh, asymptomatic. I mean, I do a fair amount of stool testing, DNA, PCR stool testing, and sometimes I'll see Campylobacter or other organisms like that, and the person doesn't even have symptoms. So is it, is it possible that someone could have even had a, a food, you know, you know, exposure to one of these bacteria that can cause this condition and not even known it. For sure. And so the thing is, if you're coming into the doctor with diarrhea, day one of diarrhea could have been the same, could have been the food poisoning. You don't know. The other thing is most food poisonings are marginally eventful. Um, and so you had a little diarrhea, you went on a trip somewhere and you kind of brushed it off. It was one day. Yeah. That would have been enough. And so, you don't have to remember some apocalypse of <laughs> events in your life for it to be triggering IBS or mm -hmm. the SIBO. So that's why the markers are so important because it could have been something that really didn't even affect you all that much. Didn't and register. Yeah. Positive, so you're right. 
So I want to clarify something for the listeners um, because it, it might be a little bit confusing. So when you have these antibodies, my understanding is that decreases the motility of the small intestine, the oral cecal transit time. So the time it takes something to get from, you know, when you swallow it to when it gets to the large intestine, which might be a little counterintuitive because someone's might be saying like, hey, wait, I have diarrhea. I have frequent stools. So how, how could this be a condition of decreased motility? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that are going on when you, when in this process. First of all, one of the things that happens is, as you say, the motility is diminished, but I think it's even more specific than that. I think it's actually diminishing the cleaning wave of the gut. So mm-hmm. then the bacteria build up and they, of course, have all sorts of chemicals like lipopolysaccharides that can cause some inflammation. There's inflammation around the nerves and, and the actual flow of the gut is different. The absorption of liquid is different. And so while things may be moving in a different way through the small bowel and, and maybe on a gross level slowly, if more fluid gets into the colon, you can't absorb it all and you end up with diarrhea. Right. Not to mention the bloating and the gas and the stension from the, all the extra bugs that are there from this. So mm-hmm. it, it's more complicated than simply how slow or how fast the small bowel moves. Some of the, and I'm just going to say one more sort of yeah. random thing, but there are patients, for example, who have uh, other diseases that are not related to what we're talking about today, where the gut is very stiff. And so the gut is moving extremely slowly, but it acts like a tube, like a funnel, and doesn't hold anything in, and they have lots of diarrhea. So how fast and how slow the small bowel moves doesn't really predict diarrhea as a phenotype because things could just be washing through, which right. is diarrhea. Right. I hope that sort of answers. Yeah, that. yeah, definitely. So again, just in the interest of helping listeners understand this, so we could say, and I'm not going to hold you to, to this, but that in, a, in the subset of people who test positive for these antibodies, especially people who test positive for both, one way of looking at this is that IBS in those situations are what we've been calling uh, the, the condition previously known as IBS, perhaps it will be at some point, is an autoimmune condition that is affecting the nerves in the small intestine or is in, in some sense causing nerve damage in the small intestine. And that is what is leading to these symptoms of gas and bloating and you know, uh, altered stool frequency. Yes, that's the hypothesis we're working on. Wow, that is a big paradigm change. (laughs) Yeah. It's hard to even get my head around, you know, all of the, you know, what what that means for approaching this condition. But another question that that came up, I think, on the last show when we talked about this, I know that so far this test has only been validated for people with IBSD or IBS uh, diarrhea. So tell tell me more about that. Like, why do you think, uh, this is not the case for IBS-C constipation. And do you, th- do you think it has something to do with, and, and as an extension, you know, how does this relate to people who test positive for methane predominant SIBO? Because uh, for the listeners that are not aware, methane, people who have methane predominant SIBO or an overproduction of methane in the small intestine will, more often will have constipation than diarrhea. So is this test useful for people who have IBS-C or methane-predominant SIBO or, or just IBS-D and IBS-mixed? So we published one study looking at this, and what we're able to see is that the test is very helpful, of course, most helpful if there's a component of diarrhea to the condition. Mm-hmm. So mixed and D is where it's most fruitful. If you compare IBS-C to healthy people, more people with IBS-C have the antibody than healthy people, although we didn't have enough numbers to make it to reach statistical significance, but its its power is much less. And we know this from food poisoning outbreaks, that food poisoning outbreaks generally precipitate or result in the diarrhea flavor of IBS, if you want to call it that, or the diarrhea or mixed IBS. So really two-thirds of IBS could benefit from the test. In regards to your sort of second part of the question is the methane. We don't understand why the methane blooms in this way or you get this overabundance of methane organisms and methane production leading to constipation and maybe the mechanism is different. So some of the things that I say in lectures now is I'm starting to think that there's sort of this group 
of IBSD and mixed, which are the sort of the post-infectious and the autoimmune type mm -hmm. markers. And then there's the other group, which maybe the pathophysiology is different and the methane, you know, just increases for reasons we don't yet understand leading to the constipation. Then maybe they're two separate disorders, but we're still working on that. Okay. And, you know, we're, we're getting pretty deep in the weeds here, but I'm so sorry, listeners, if you're not following, but um, I know, you know a lot of my audience is clinicians and practitioners, so I want to get into this. Is there a correlation between breath test results and the IBS smart test? So, for example, if somebody has only elevated methane on a breath test and not hydro, you know, elevated hydrogen, would they be a lot less likely to test positive for on the blood test? Or is there not really, have you not looked at that? Or is there not a correlation between the hydrogen and methane and the, and the blood test results? Well, answer your question, and then I'll sort of lead into sort of a, a little bit of a different flavor sure. of, of what I think is important for the audience, is that, you know, we, we think that the hydrogen part of the story is more the diarrhea part and the methane is more the constipation part. So that and part, we basically in our clinic tend to see that the methane positive would be less likely to be positive on the blood test. Mm. But, but I, I think I would look at the breath test and the blood test sort of in a, in a different framework. It's sort of like you have a heart condition and you do an EKG and you do an ultrasound of the heart to look for the structural changes. The, the two tests complement each other. So let me start with the blood test. Your blood test is positive. As a clinician, in, you know, as in my clinic, I'm going to tell you why this all started. I'm going to tell you, you better avoid food poisoning from here on as best as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying don't travel. I'm saying travel much more cautiously than others because yeah. number one, you're more likely to get food poisoning if these antibodies are positive. Ah. Two, if you get food poisoning again, the antibodies go higher and you're harder to treat. We do see and, and again, we haven't published this yet, but we absolutely see a difference in somebody whose vinculin level is super high in terms of their response to treatment. They're less likely to respond. So the biomarker gives you some prognosis of success of therapy or why therapies are failing. So there's a lot of value in the blood test. Right. The breath test tells you what to use to treat. So if you're hydrogen, you'd want to use something more along the lines of rifaximin, which is what we do in our clinic. Yeah. If you're methane, your methane doesn't respond well to rifaximin alone. And our published double blind study suggests you should give rifaximin plus another antibiotic like neomycin or even metronidazole. So it, it stratifies the algorithm of treatment when using the breath test. But the biomarker is extremely valuable at counseling the patient and right. validating the illness. Okay, good. That's, I think that's, much, that's clear now. Um, thanks for that. So let's let's move on to talking how this affects this this really you know significant paradigm shift in understanding the etiology and pathogenesis of IBS D at least and mixed as being an, a post infectious autoimmune con condition that impacts the the nerves of the gut. So how is this shifting treatment and how you approach treatment? Well, so the treatment is the other part, which is sort of alluded to with the complement of the blood test and the breath test. But the other part about the blood test is the higher the antivinculin, that's the autoantibody or the autoimmune antibody, the higher that is, the more likely you are to relapse is what we're seeing in the clinic. Now, again, we're early days. We have to do objective publications, peer review publications on kind of how this works. But, but we are seeing this in our clinic, these high level um, antivinculins tend to require prokinetics to keep the bacteria away once you've succeeded with antibiotics. Uh -huh. So the marker also gives us some guidance that a prokinetic might be important as a follow through after antibiotics. A little complicated to go there right now because we haven't really touched on that. Right. The antibiotics we use though, still again, if you're hydrogen on the breath test, we still give rifaximin. You could simply give rifaximin by itself if the patient has diarrhea because the likelihood is that it's hydrogen and right. maybe you can skip the breath test for hydrogen, but even that's changing since hydrogen sulfide is coming soon. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. But so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about prokinetics because, again, my, my audience is pretty, they're pretty sharp on this stuff. So prokinetic, kinetic meaning movement pro stimulating movement. Uh, so this is, these are medications that increase that 
cleansing wave that you were talking about that is probably decreased or dysregulated by the the antibody production, the autoimmune condition. Correct. And, and we know that you know some of the earlier versions of these drugs were eventually pulled from the market because of you know, side effects or adverse effects. So w- what's new here? What you know? What are you using these days? And and what what kind of results are you seeing? I know it's still early days, but yeah. So I, so once we've given the antibiotic, let's say the patient responds very well. The person has SIBO. Their antibodies positive. They've responded very well to antibiotics. Uh, maybe we put them on a diet, and again, that may come up later in the conversation. But mm-hmm. we have to decide: do we use a prokinetic now, or do we not use a prokinetic now? Uh, obviously, there are patients where they take the antibiotic, and they don't come back for two years. They're doing fine. So I don't want to give somebody a prokinetic if they're not going to have a relapse for two sure. years. That's a waste of money and, and energy on the patient's part, and also a drug being taken for no reason. Yeah. So sometimes I will wait till the first relapse to see what it, what is the time between instances of SIBO relapse uh, to dictate. So if it's more than six months, I may not give uh, the prokinetic. If it's greater than six months, I may give the or less than six months. I may give a, a right. prokinetic. The antibodies are are telling me now that if they're really high, I'm going to jump to a prokinetic sooner, maybe even after the first treatment. But the prokinetic that I generally use following a successful treatment with antibiotics is erythromycin is a prokinetic at very low doses. And for example, 50 milligrams or a quarter of 250 milligrams, which would give us 62 and a half milligrams, mm-hmm. which is cheaper. So that's what I, I use sort of as a first line because it's cheap and it's, been, it's safe and it's been around forever. But there are two new kids on the block. Now, one is procalipride, and the other is uh, tegacerod, and their trade names here in the U.S. are Motegrity and Zelnorm. Now, some of you may remember Zelnorm. Yes. Zelnorm was a drug we had in the last decade. It was a very successful prokinetic, and then there was some suspicion that maybe there was an association with cardiovascular risk or cerebrovascular, meaning stroke or heart attacks. Yeah. Well, that was later found to be there's no there there, and so the a company brought the product back, did further safety, and now it just recently got FDA approved. Now, I don't think you can get it by prescription quite yet. I think they're stocking pharmacies and gearing up production, but procalipride can be obtained. Now, just to put the context on the two products, they are both both procalipride and tegacerod are serotonin agonists. So they basically bind to the serotonin receptors and make the gut move more correctly. Most people don't know that you know, they've heard of serotonin as a neurotransmitter in the brain, but there's actually 400 times more serotonin in the gut, which is why these drugs work in this way. Right. And as long as the drug doesn't cross in through the blood brain barrier, uh, there's limited or no side effects to the patient. And, you know, studies have shown that some of the thoughts around these products were incorrect and that they didn't create these problems. And so the FDA has reviewed uh, more than a decade of studies in Europe because the drug was never taken off the market in other parts of the world. And procalipride has been available in Europe, I would say, almost a decade. And so all that data was available for the FDA to, to review and certainly they were they were comfortable with what they learned about the product on the market in other parts. Okay, so a few questions about these prokinetic options. So erythromycin is, is an antibiotic, of course, but it, this is using it at a much lower dose. Do we know anything about the impacts that it has on the colonic microbiome, you know, that are beneficial bacteria when it's taken at a, at a low dose like this? Yeah, so what we've seen in with, with the in the context of erythromycin is that Erythromycin at this tiny dose literally is below any MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration is the acronym Mm -hmm. uh, for for bacteria. So it really isn't an antibiotic in any true sense. At that dose. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we've learned over the years is that it really has had no impact on the... It's not acting like an antibiotic despite its name. It's Mm -hmm. too low a dose. It's acting like a prokinetic. Okay. And then I, I know some, from some correspondence that we've had that, and other uh, sources that I've read that prucalipride uh, 
is a little bit tricky to take as a prokinetic in, in the context of, of this condition and trying to deal with it. My, my understanding from what I've read, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have to take it a minimum of four hours after your last meal and then do a 12 hour fast over, after that. So let's say, you know, if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, you'd have to finish dinner by six and then take it at 10 and then you couldn't eat until 10 the next morning. Is, is that how you're using it? And if so, how many <laughs> patients have you got to actually use this regularly? Oh, so it's, it's not quite that stringent. Um, okay. Generally what we do is we say it's two hours after the last meal of the day or at bedtime. So if you eat at 8 p.m. and you go to bed at midnight, that's perfect. If okay. you eat at 8 p.m. and you take it at 10.30, that's fine too, as long as you don't take any calories in the two hours preceding the dose. And it's right. not that that's going to hurt you by taking it closer. It simply means that you're not in a fasting state. You're not going to trigger the cleaning waves. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, erythromycin only has, I would say, six hours mm -hmm. of activity anyway. So mm -hmm. you don't need to fast for 12 hours after any of the prokinetics. I think if you're fasting overnight and you're just sleeping for eight hours, that's plenty of time. So, well, that certainly um, seems easier. Uh, um, when I read that, I thought, man, this, there's going to be some compliance issues with this medication. But, um, you know, what you're saying here is just probably, you know, pretty much what was recommended in general. And, you know, don't eat too close to bedtime and, and, you know, don't eat during the night. I think most people could probably handle that. Do you see any meaningful difference in terms of efficacy between these medications? And I know you mentioned that you'll, you'll tend to use erythromycin first because it's cheaper, readily available. Is there any difference in efficacy that, that, that you've witnessed or is, is, is it mostly just a question of cost and convenience? In terms of choosing which one? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, erythromycin, funny things are happening with drug companies, and uh, I don't want to get off on too far a tangent, but <laughs> you know, we've gotten into this situation, and I think Congress is even looking into this, where generic drugs that have been around for decades generally were lower cost because they've been around a long time and manufacturing has been you know nailed down and it's easy to make and and all of that but once generics start dropping drugs and then there's only one or two manufacturers they can take the opportunity to increase the price yeah so i've seen erythromycin in the days where it was you know uh, five dollars to buy a whole month of erythromycin and now the prices have all been jacked up and um, so erythromycin still is anticipated to be cheaper than procalipride or tegacerod, but those gaps are changing because uh, the makers of erythromycin have increased the price. And what about insurance approval? Like I know one of the main issues clinically that we have with rifaximin is that it's only approved for IBSD if they've failed other treatments and it's not actually technically approved for SIBO. So if you prescribe procalipride or tegacerod or even erythromycin for, you know, in this situation, are, are patients getting insurance coverage? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. And, and again, the answer is a little complicated, but yeah. let, me, let me start with Rifaximin because I think your, your audience needs to sort of understand how this is framed out. So let's go back to the 1980s, the condition called peptic ulcer disease. So you have an ulcer in your stomach or in the first part of your small intestine, you scope, you see this ulcer, it's like a crater and you, that's called peptic ulcer disease. And then a gentleman by the name of Dr. Barry Marshall discovered that H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, was a bacteria that causes peptic ulcers. Yeah. And so all of a sudden ulcers were being treated with antibiotics. And then now ulcers are going away because... But, but where, I'm, where I'm getting to with all this, we didn't change the name peptic ulcer disease to H. pylori disease. Right. It's still peptic ulcer disease. But 70% of peptic ulcer disease was caused by H. pylori. It's the same thing here. So we have irritable bowel syndrome, which is the constellation of symptoms by which you present to your physician. And by definition, you are IBSD. Now, we now know that IBSD, 70% of it is caused by SIBO, but it is still IBSD. So yeah. it's fully legitimate in my mind to say that despite SIBO being the cause of your IBSD, you have IBSD and 
should be qualified for rifaximin and using that terminology, but your physician has to qualify you as IBSD, but that SIBO is the cause. Yeah. So that should clear up the issue because as long as you put IBSD there, 80 plus percent of patients are covered to a greater or lesser extent by their insurance, so maybe a copay. Right. Um, when it comes to the prokinetics though, it's a bit of a, a, free fall, a free-for-all because both of the two more modern prokinetics, the Tegaserod and the Procalipride, are totally brand new. And because they're totally brand new, insurance companies are still trying to figure out the product and where it's going to be placed in their algorithms. Right. So almost universally, they're being denied without petition. Mm-hmm. Uh, the doctor has to kind of get the prior auths in and, and push the, the insurance company to pay for it. And we're getting... Right. We're getting insurance to cover some of it, but we're getting a lot of pushback early, early yeah. on. Give it a few months. Yeah, yeah. And then the erythromycin, I mean, that's obviously been around for a long time, but this is a, an off-label use, I would imagine. So is that also typically pushback from insurance companies? Yeah, we've we gotten a lot less pushback from erythromycin simply because it's an older product and insurance right. companies don't pay attention to that as much. Yeah. Uh, but you know, 80% of drugs used by clinicians are off-label. So being off label and an old drug doesn't really create a lot of stress or concern by insurance yeah. companies. Yeah. Okay. It's a typical thing. So I want to circle back to these the use of these drugs in the context of IBSC and, and methane predominant SIBO, which I mean it's interesting to me because these drugs are are being again used in condition where just when someone's thinking about their overall motility, they have diarrhea, and then they're taking prokinetics. I mean, you've explained very well why that is, is necessary and helpful. But is the converse also true that even though you would kind of assume if someone's motility, overall motility is decreased, as in the case of constipation, that promotility drugs would be effective, that they're actually not because, you know, especially if the antibodies aren't positive? So uh, I guess I'm trying to understand the question. Are you suggesting, well, why not just do prokinetic versus? Well, let's say someone comes in and and they have IBS-C and they test positive for methane predominant SIBO, but they don't have antibodies. Would prokinetics still be effective in that situation or are they not because there the mechanism isn't the same as, you know, like the the decreased motility in the small intestine or we don't at least know that, that it is. Got it. Yeah, I got it. So, again, there, there is, it's complicated, but I'm going to... I'm not trying to give you a hard time. It's just... No, no, I mean, your questions are amazing, to be honest, and, and they're really sophisticated and kind of the things that we're working through because these are questions we ask ourselves as we go through what, what's the next step in the science to, mm-hmm. to prove this and then the next thing and the next thing. But, yeah. but if you get rid of methane... And I, if I can get rid of methane in, the, in, the, in that person down to a very low level, their bowel movements are normal. So obviously they do not need a prokinetic. The problem we have is that antibiotics, like the cocktail that I mentioned earlier, rifaximin plus neomycin, it will reduce your methane to a normal level 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. The problem is the methane keeps wanting to come back. Yes. Often... Unlike the other side, the, the diarrhea side, where you can take rifaximin and you could go a year or two years without any recurrence, methane is generally recurring a month or two later because those bugs are hard to get rid of. Remember, methane bugs are archaea. They're not bacteria. We didn't design antibiotics for archaea. They're right. designed as antibacterials. And it's only fortunate that we can get some cocktails that have some influence, but they're not really killing the bugs as much as we'd want. So we've been trying to come up with better ways but in the meantime yes we we give the antibiotic and we give the prokinetic hoping that the methanogens don't re- relapse but it isn't because of the autoimmunity it's a different right. sort of mechanism so there's some possibility that prokinetics just by stimulating that cleansing wave make it harder for the archaea to reestablish themselves but it's not by the same mechanism. Right, and it's a trickier setup. proposition. So I'm not of the mindset that diarrhea is a treatment for constipation. I'm right. not of the mindset that laxatives are what patients should be on the rest of their life. 
yeah. constipation. I'm of the mindset of why do they have constipation and treat the why, uh, and then the bowel movements become normal. And the, the methane is part of that story. If you get rid of the methane, you don't get diarrhea. You just feel good and you feel normal. Yeah. And that's where we're heading. But that's where lovastatin comes in. We haven't gotten to that yet, but yeah. Well, let's get to that. But Mark, I have to say, you're a functional medicine practitioner at heart. Yeah. Always, always looking for the underlying cause. That's what I appreciate about you. And I mean, I I think I mentioned this on our previous interview, but I I for the listeners, I I saw Dr. Pimentel as a patient. This got to be 20 years ago now, when I when I had gotten back from Indonesia and had my episode of serious food poisoning, which is what started all of my symptoms. So this is, of course, of great personal interest for me as well. But I've always appreciated your, your, your relentless pursuit of, you know, what's the real cause of what's going on here instead of just being content to, you know, use antibiotics for the rest of a patient's life or, you know, I mean, sometimes you need to, to do that over and over, but ideally we get to a place where we under, better understand these conditions and we can develop treatments that don't have as much potential for harm. Well, I'm so, I'm, and thank you for that very gracious commentary and also sharing your story. But I, I hate and I've always fought against personally in my own personal career single-mindedness mm-hmm. uh, because, and I'm not picking on functional medicine per se, but there are people who are very pro yeast being a problem, but then every patient that comes in the door is a yeast problem. Yeah. And, you got uh, a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. Everything looks like a nail. Now I'm not saying yeast isn't a problem in a subset of patients. I think it is actually, and we could discuss CFO at, at some point during this. So yes. I do believe that there is, but I, a lot of scientists, and this isn't a functional medicine thing or a science thing, but a lot of scientists themselves uh, are looking at everything as a nail once they find something. Yeah. And I have seen too many people get in trouble and trapped in, in those kinds of mindsets. Not everything's going to be a nail, and we have to find a different solution for a different problem. And, mm-hmm. and I, I recognize that antibiotics are not going to work for IBS C, and methane requires a different hammer because it's a different yeah. nail or maybe a screwdriver, right. you have to move on. So Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I, one of my mentors in medicine used to also say, if you look for something hard enough, you usually find it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that kind of myopic uh, focus doesn't really serve anyone. So you, a uh, couple of things, you had mentioned, well, you just mentioned lovastatin and, and I, I, want, I was going to ask you uh, about other treatments for methane predominant SIBO that, you're, that you've been investigating. So maybe that's a good segue. Sure. Should we talk about lovastatin? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So lovastatin, and this is something that was derived from some data we were seeing coming out of the animal literature and veterinary world, but lovastatin appears to reduce methane in animals and in, in, in uh, cows and other ruminant animals. And what we started to study in our lab is, okay, well, let's study all the statins that are out there. Well, first of all, we looked at our database and we couldn't see a pattern where statins were associated with less constipation. The problem was what we didn't realize until we did the research in the lab is that a statin is not a statin is not a statin. Uh, When we tested lovastatin, we got immediate reduction of methane. Mm -hmm. But every time that lovastatin molecule was broken or readjusted to make your cholesterol go down, it was ruining what nature developed, which was lovastatin. And so going back to the original thing I said, we couldn't find a pattern because most people are on contemporary statins that are human made, meaning the molecules have been modified specifically in a way that makes cholesterol go down, but it's ruined the natural lovastatin's ability to drop methane. So back to this story is that you got to get the original lovastatin from the fungus that's called aspergillus, and that lovastatin blocks an enzyme in the methane-producing organisms so that they stop producing methane. We saw it in the lab, then we partnered with a company to develop one that's not absorbed, that stays in the gut, and that currently is coded as SYN010 or SYN10, and that product is in clinical trials right now. The first clinical trial showed that it dropped methane, and when methane dropped, constipation got better. 
small study, but now we're in the midst of a big phase two study and we're recruiting right now. So if any of your viewers are in California and they're constipated and methane, we're looking for folks, sorry for the plug, but no, no, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes on the website. So folks, it's, uh, it's that trial. we're hopeful that it's going to help a lot of people with CIBS or constipation who have methane. Great. Yeah. So after I'll follow up and get the link and we, we'll put it in the show notes. So anyone who wants to participate that can, in that can, and just let me clarify. So this, in this case, this SIN 10 new derivative of lovastatin or old perhaps is not being systemically absorbed, you said. So it's not going to have any impact on cholesterol or would not be expected to have some of the potential side effects that statins have. Co- correct. So what we saw in the first trial is really essentially little or no side effects from the statin, you know, not at the rates you would expect from absorbed statins, right. uh, muscle aches and, and liver tests and all those changes because it's not absorbed. And the studies of absorption of this sort of modification of lovastatin show that it hardly gets absorbed into the bloodstream, which is, again, it's sort of like rifaximin, where rifaximin yeah. is an antibiotic but doesn't get absorbed. Yeah. Lovastatin is a statin that doesn't get absorbed. So cholesterol is not going to go down with this. So right. Yeah. For cholesterol, this is not the right thing. Right. It's purely a drug for bugs. Right. Okay. So, and, and then would this be a situation where people would take it for a certain period of time, almost like an antibiotic and, and then just, you know, if it re- recurs, they would take it again or would they take it continuously to, you know, keep the methane, the archaea and the methane production inhibited? Cause it's not, is it actually killing the archaea by disrupting the enzyme or is it just, just decreasing the methane production of the archaea? The study we're doing currently, we're going to get those exact questions. Right. What we saw in the first trial we didn't do all the microbiome stuff in the stool. But what we saw in the first trial is that in some patients, and it was a handful of patients where methane disappeared after the drug for a, a long period of time after, even though you've stopped the product, they continue to have no methane recurrence. And I think some of those are still methane free. So I don't know what it, obviously if the methane organisms are not producing methane, they're not producing energy. If they're not producing energy, they're weakened and maybe they can't multiply. Right. And I think what happens is a new world order of the microbiome takes over. And mm-hmm. so in that vacuum of the methanogens, other organisms fill in the gap and then the methanogens can no longer kind of... Right. They, they get out competed. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Survival of the fittest in the microbiome. They yeah. look clones in the gut. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hopefully a better outcome in the gut. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. don't want to repeat season eight of yeah, the microbiome. We don't want the drug and torching uh, of effect of uh, Westeros. But yeah, so you mentioned CIFO. I'm glad you brought that up because I somehow had forgotten to include that in the uh, bullet points I sent you for uh, questions that we might cover. But I'm really glad you reminded me because I've been curious about this. There have now been, I think, two or, or is it three studies that have been published in the literature about this. And, and for the listeners, this is small intestinal fungal overgrowth as opposed to bacterial overgrowth. So what do we know about this condition so far? And, and as far as I understand, there's still no commercially available testing for it that, that clinicians can order. Yeah, so CIFO is a little complicated. Uh, Dr. Satish Rao, a very good friend of mine, um, I saw him just this past weekend at the meeting, he studies CIFO, and, uh, but again, it's a very complicated approach. He has to do a scope, get in the small bowel, take the juice out, and then specifically culture uh, using his, uh, his lab to find out if the fungus are there. And then in that group, and, and if I'm correct in what he, he's previously presented at these meetings, it, it's, it's, a, it's a small minority of patients with IBS uh, D or presumed IBS D and patients with bloating that have CIFO, but obviously when it's identified and he identifies it, the patients respond very well to anti- antifungals. Uh-huh. I, I think we've all seen this in our clinic. We do have patients where if we give an antifungal, nothing else is working, that yeah. there's benefit. It's going to be a subgroup of this population. And, and mm-hmm. I don't know what it has to do with the antibodies yet and how all that fits together though. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't, I, I've, I've often wondered, you know, in, in a subset of patients who we treat with antibiotics for SIBO who get worse, I've found myself wondering if they have SIFO and if, you know, reducing the bacterial levels in the small intestine actually makes it easier for the fung, fungal organisms to win the Game of Thrones, so to speak, in there. And, and that's why they're, they're getting worse. But I mean, we don't have obviously the, the research we need yet to answer those questions, but it has yeah, crossed the my data, mind. The data are coming. I mean, one of the things that received a lot of attention this past weekend was our uh, new effort here in the MAST program is the, the Reimagine study. So the Reimagine study for your listeners is uh, any patient coming for a scope, an upper scope, not a colonoscopy because we don't want that clean washout. Uh, yeah. We're taking juice from the small bowel and doing and genetics and blood and you know all the characteristics of the patients and questionnaires and we're compiling it into a, a massive data set to associate what bugs are there with what disease. So our hope, of course, is to characterize SIBO, which we presented this past weekend. Mm -hmm. And SIBO is characterized, at least the hydrogen SIBO, by excessive proteobacteria, which are E. coli, Klebsiella, and those types. Mm -hmm. And that was a big finding. It was a plenary session at this meeting. But that session, our deep sequencing correlated with culture correlated with breath test and correlated with patient symptoms. So for the first time, we were able to say with great certainty that the breath test is absolutely valid and absolutely predictive of the bugs that are in the small intestine. And now we know what bugs are there. But the reason I went into this whole tangent on the reimagined study is because we will be looking at fungus at some point from these, yeah. this juice we've taken out. Right. And we will be looking at associations between all these microbiome in the small intestine and human disease like diabetes, Parkinson's, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so we're, we're at the beginning. We only have about 400 patients on our way to 10,000. But we're, we're going to keep plugging along. We're already finding connections. Yeah, that's exciting and definitely seems like the next step here, uh, especially Make, drawing the connection between the, you know, what you see with the DNA PCR testing and the breath test and symptoms so that there's, you know, a, a clear line between those things. Now to that end, uh, there was a recent paper in nature, which I know you uh, have seen that f had uh, findings, which at least on the surface seem to contradict what you just said. So I'm curious to hear your take. They found an inverse correlation between microbial diversity in the small intestine and GI symptoms and intestinal permeability, but they found that the presence of bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, as, as I think they measured by aspirate, didn't correlate with symptoms. So essentially they were saying that bacterial overgrowth wasn't connected to symptoms, but reduced diversity, or you know, we could say dysbiosis in the small intestine was. So what did, did it, first of all, did I characterize that correctly? And second of all, what did you make of these findings? Yeah, so this is a study from the Mayo Clinic. And I, I mean, I don't want to go all off on the, on the study, but the first problem with the study is nearly 50% of patients in that trial had SIBO, which no study has ever shown uh, mm -hmm. that that many people have SIBO. So first of all, in culture specifically. So the population is a little bit, suspicious. Either these patients were hand chosen because of symptoms, because what we're doing is we're just taking all comers. The second thing is uh, there's a lot of concern in how they determine SIBO because they added the anaerobic culture to the aerobic. They added all the cultures together. We don't do that because that isn't traditionally how SIBO was defined. SIBO was defined as using McConkie egg or, or a particular uh, type of growth on a particular type of media that cultures colon bacteria. And those are the bugs that are predictive. And the sec final thing is, to my knowledge, they don't describe the catheter they use, which can get contaminated as you push it through the scope. What we do, or they don't use a catheter at all. They don't describe it. We had to develop a catheter that had two lumens, one tube inside another with a cap on it that as we push it through the scope, it's not getting any of the junk that was sucked in the scope as they're passing it through. So no oral flora, no esophageal flora, no stomach acid or juices. 
and then we had to validate that. We spent a year validating the techniques for isolating bacteria from the thick mucousy juice from the small intestine. And you can't use the sequencing technology or sequencing methods from stool because it doesn't work well in the juice. So mm-hmm. once we did our, to validate our technique, then we applied our statistics and we, we found much less SIBO than they did. And we also identified the specific organisms that they didn't. And, and so I have a lot of things to say about that paper uh, that don't quite add up. And I think others are yeah. finding the same thing. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to more of your findings because it sounds like you've got a great model now set up to collect this, uh, these data. Yeah. So the other thing that that paper suggested or that, you know, that, that they found, and I'm, I'm not, I have to go back and look at the exact methods. I'm not recalling them off the top of my head, but they found that a, a low residue diet or low fiber diet, um, you know, what we might characterize the standard American diet as, but which is also what's often re- recommended for patients with SIBO may cause dysbiosis in the small intestine and worsen symptoms. So I wanted to ask you about your take on that. And I imagine that a lot of the things you just said would probably impact the, your answer to this, because if the, the way that they collected the data wasn't sound, then, then none, this would all not be really reliable anyways. Well, I think that's the big problem is, is how did they collect all of this? And, you know, what was their methodology correct? And, and just based on what we know from the North American consensus and information that we currently know, that they're not using, well, they never validated their techniques to begin with, in, in my opinion. So, mm-hmm. so that's, a, that's a problem first and foremost. But taking it in a little slightly different direction, we do know, for example, that the low FODMAP diet, which is the extreme low fermentation, I mean, it's the ultimate low fermentation diet, it does reduce diversity in the intestinal tract, uh, at least in the stool. I mean, people haven't studied the small bowel until the paper you just described, but it does reduce diversity, which can potentially be something harmful. But we have to study what happens in the small bowel using a bit more rigor, and hopefully that will come in the coming years. So since we're on the topic of diet, is there any, anything else that's changed in that world for you, especially related to the, the sh- you know, just the overall shift in understanding of, of SIBO, as a, at least with IBSD and IBS mixed, uh, as an con- autoimmune condition that's affecting the nervous system of the gut? Or are, there, are your recommendations still pretty much the same? You know, I think, so we, we, just to be clear, we, we tend to use what's called a low fermentation diet, something that we sort of put together. The intention of the low fermentation diet is that you can take this diet and eat in almost any restaurant in the country. My goal in life, as I said before, is to find the cause of a disease and treat it. But my, also, my secondary goal is I want patients to live a normal and live their best life. Mm-hmm. And if all they do all day is not want to go to restaurants with friends because they have to ask the waiter 20 questions before they order anything, that's embarrassing for them. So my, the diet is less restrictive than the low FODMAP diet. But I think what we're learning is that, and this is relatively new to the last year, is that the low FODMAP diet may not be the be all end all uh, that we thought it was. Certainly, and then this is for your viewers, and I'm going to emphasize this, mm-hmm. you should not be on the low FODMAP diet more than three months because we know that you get nutritional deficiencies from it. It's too restrictive. That yeah. means you should be managed by a dietitian or by somebody who's experienced with it because you have to reintroduce foods with time. It also reduces diversity of the microbiome, which may be harmful in the long run. Right. So sometimes I see these patients in my clinic and they've been on the low FODMAP diet for a year. And I'm like, wow, that's that or not, longer. Not, I mean, not is, it. yeah. I mean, is it possible that the low FODMAP diet for an extended period of time could reduce diversity in the microbiome, which then leads to a decreased capacity to digest FODMAPs or or process them? Yeah, it's not clear because mm-hmm. you know if you change your diet so dramatically, it may create an imbalance. That, like I said, with the methane, you know, we just impact one organism. And all of a sudden, the methane can't doesn't come back. That may create that new world order that's beneficial. 
But if you reduce 500 different organisms or 100 different organisms, you're you're changing metabolic pathways in many ways that we don't quite understand. Right. So like everything else, I, mean, I think your mother probably, my mother taught me this, do everything in moderation and actually take that to heart. You, yeah. should, you shouldn't be extreme in anything. You should eat broccoli, but that shouldn't be all you eat. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, we know from other studies that like, for example, just people in Japan who live in cer- certain parts of Japan, especially where they eat a ton of seaweed, their gut microbiota changes from that, you know, to actually produce more of the compounds that help to digest those non typically non digestible polysaccharides. So it makes sense to me that if you cut foods out of the diet for too long, that we might actually start to lose the the production of enzymes and other compounds that are required to digest those foods because the body's pretty ruthless when it comes to that kind of things, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, if it's like, Hey, we're, if we're not needing to digest these things, we're going to conserve energy or the bacterial microbiome maybe as well. So, yeah. And the question is once you've lost that organism, in your gut, how easy is it to get it back? If you do bring those diets, yes. Diet if, it, if it's yeah, dropped to a point where you can't, Get that, and that leads to a whole another conversation about things like probiotics and FMT, which we don't have time for. But I, I just uh, wanted to finish up by give, giving you a chance to talk about any other findings. I know uh, we've talked about some of the new findings, and maybe all of them that you announced at the conference. Anything else that you want to tell us about? There were two other two other big things that we presented at the conference that I may be important to your your listeners. Uh, number one is the proton pump inhibitors. They really don't change the microbiome and they don't really cause SIBO or a change in diversity. This is part of the reimagined study. And this was a huge number of patients, uh, over 150 patients in that study. And yeah, wow, that really contradicts some of the previous ideas or findings there. Yeah, and it's uh, very definitive. Um, and then the second thing is using this these new techniques that we've been spending more than a year validating them in in our lab, we're now able to assess the microbiome, the DNA from bacteria in samples that are in formalin sitting in the pathology department for years. So we were able to go back and look at old appendectomies from appendicitis. And we found that between 30 and 45% of appendectomies are for food poisoning. So it turns out Campylobacter was sitting in the appendix causing the inflammation or that's what we believe. Yeah. And maybe you could have been treated with antibiotics, didn't need to take the appendix out. But but the important aspect of that is for all the years of appendicitis, the number one surgical procedure in the US, nobody knew what caused it. And maybe yeah. Campylobacter is the cause of appendicitis in at least a third. So wow. uh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all. And it is because, ex- you know, it's like, why would the appendix just go crazy (laughs) all of a sudden, you know, and now, you know, I always wondered about a a possible infectious agent and that's that, yeah, that's quite an amazing, uh, uh, so imagine what we can do with all the different tissues from different sort of things that happen in the body. And now we can start. It makes me wonder about, uh, you know, gallbladder. Yeah. That's, that's on our list. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Great. Well, so, so what's, I mean, you, you, you seem to be a busy guy, Dr. Pimental, and it's all great work. But what, what's uh, next in the most immediate future? I know we touched on hydrogen sulfide earlier and then on the last show. So I gather that there's, uh, those findings aren't quite ready yet, but must be coming in the, in the oh, near it's, it's coming very soon. Um, and I always say that and people are, you know, <laughs> but that's not tomorrow. And, and you know, the problem is things are out of my hands. Sometimes yeah. And, and yeah. those commercial, you know, the commercial people uh, do things in a particular way or order. And, and it's for the benefit of doing it right. But it just takes longer than I wish I it could. Sure. So the patients can have access to it. Are, uh, are you able to tell us whether this is related to diagnosis or treatment or both? Uh, the delays? No, the what's coming. Oh, no, it's it's for diagnosis and we believe treatment. Okay. Uh, so hydrogen sulfide is, we think, the cause of the diarrhea side, and it's supplementary to the hydrogen. So mm-hmm. it's going to be make a big impact, and so I'm looking yeah. forward to that. 
Definitely. I, I am too, of just having, having a way to test for that and, and be certain. I mean, we, we have just a suspicion at this point based on cert, sometimes certain presentations with the clinically and with the blood test, but it'll, or with the breath test, but it'll be great to be able to back that up. Uh, with Perfect. Valid test. So Mark, uh, thank you so much again. I know that people are going to love this show. We covered uh, an amazing amount of ground in a relatively short period of time, but I um, very much appreciate your time and, and just your, your life's work here in, in this field. It's, it's an enormously helpful for clinicians and for patients because I, I don't need to tell you that so many people are affected by this condition. I mean, IBS, I think, is now the second leading cause of people missing work. It's, it's really an epidemic. And so finding answers here is just going to help so many people. So, so thank you for continuing to do this work. Well, th again, thank you for having me on the show. And, and I know that what you're trying to do to, to disseminate, you know, accurate information is very valuable. And, and, you know, patients are much more informed than they were before. And we just want to make sure what's out there makes sense and, and is true to data and not just, you know, because there's a lot of, a lot of misinformation. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Yeah. It's my pleasure. So I, I hope to have you back at some point for all the, the, the latest discoveries since I, there's always, it's always moving forward and that's, what's great to see. Yeah. All, all right. Again, Chris. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. That's the end of this episode of revolution health radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.